Welcome. Welcome back <clears throat> to um, another episode. <laughs> Welcome back. I don't know. I don't know. Welcome back to another episode of Chewing the Cud. Um, this is a mostly weekly live stream, although that's sort of been a lie recently, but you know, it is what it is. It just busy on the farm. But anyway, weekly live stream where we sit down at the kitchen table and discuss things related and unrelated to regenerative agriculture. Um, usually the way things, these things have been working is we'll start off with a topic for the week and then we'll move into a question answer portion of the discussion after we go through that topic this week. We're going to go throw it back to the original format of the shoe and the cud situation. And no, I'm not going to flip the phone vertical or like anything like that. <laughs> but we're just going to go pure question and answer from the get, from the jump. Um, we're going to let you guys just steer the discussion for the entirety of the of the, of the the session and um, we'll just see where it takes us. Exactly. We go as long as it's interesting, you know, or until we need to go to bed, whichever comes first. Mm -hmm. um, so... We started a little bit earlier than normal, not by much, but by a little bit. Um, yep. But yeah, that's 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 the gist of this thing. And just ask any question, comment related to agriculture, related to our our lives, and we'll you know we'll give you details we're, we're as needed or whatever. Yeah, to exactly. To a point. So <laughs> pretty much, much try me. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. So ask away start start throwing comments or questions or anything in the chat and we'll hopefully this time be able to get to everybody so let's do some introductions while we're waiting on yeah questions my name is isaac tappanen this is ben holly and connor helton we're interns here at green pastures farm with greg judy greg and jan judy um, we run around 370 head of south pole cattle roughly 160 st Croix sired hair sheep and that's counting ewes, not counting lambs. Um, it's warm water. That's, that's always nice. Uh, we do all kinds of things from baling. We sell baling rollers. We host farm tours, grazing schools. We do a little bit of consulting, um, shiitake mushrooms. We sell guard dogs. I mean, we do a lot here. And, and us three are here learning the ropes, learning how to run a successful, you know, regenerative uh, business. And so... We're loving what we're doing, loving the journey it's been. Ben and I have been here. This is going to be our, we're going on our second year yep. here. We got here in April of 2020. And so we've been we'll here be, 11 months, 12 months. Yeah, we'll be leaving around uh, April. 15 months almost. And we'll be leaving end of March, April 2022. Yeah. And then Connor showed up this this April 1st. April 1st. Yeah. April 1st on April time. Fool's. 2021. Um, what a joke this guy's been. Maybe that's why. It's been, maybe that's why it's been a crazy. Yeah. He showed up on April Fool's Day. Oh um, no. Anyways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's been doing good. Fit. You know, he, he kind of got thrown into the fire a little bit. Um, yeah. We had a wild, a wild year. Um, we're getting, rough, we're rough getting, and tumble we're at times. Kind of going now. We're getting kind of. It's starting to settle down a little bit. Which yeah. Is, very nice. Although we've, I feel like we've said that a couple times, and, and, <laughs> and then just, and some, something right happens, right, you know. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. So, anyway, that's sort of the. I mean, we could jump into you know stuff that has been going on. The reason why, I mean, my posting, I know for one, has basically gone to zero. Um, Mine's been very and, minimal. Yeah, and so, I mean, it's just, it's just we've just been we've just been a little bit busy, a little bit preoccupied with stuff that's been going on on the farm the past little while um and uh <laughs> how rude no. how dare you um and i mean we can get into that and, and get into sort of what we've been up to and why we've been so busy but um just, oh a little, little full feedback wait what, what, what was that <laughs> no, nothing no. um but <laughs> yeah i mean if, if people have, have questions about that they can go ahead but we, we can start talking about that so i guess sort of really like the first thing that we had to get involved with was um was a lot of a lot of sales at the beginning of the month um, that Isaac and I were involved in and, and Connor was manning the fort. That was sort of where we last left our story. That was sort of the last episode we did was back then, sort of after that, that whole stint. And I then, remember, when was the last time we did this? It was, it, was, it was after the first weekend in June because so it's I remember- been like three weeks? Yeah, it's been like three weeks. Oh, man. Because oh, yeah, then, because then, because then you genetics. left. Yeah, I know that we did genetics was the last mm -hmm. one we did, and then you left to go home for your brother's high school graduation, and so then you weren't here. And then the next, and then week, the next week we canceled. We, we came, we just didn't do it because we're you know we were so 
we just didn't we just strung out we were so strung out but it's it's it, anyway and then basically for the month of july i'm getting there for yes. the month of july we we didn't get a rain june june, june. june. yeah <sighs> for the month of june and most of at the end of may we hadn't gotten a single rain not a drop and so we were basically ready to implement a drought plan we had already we started it. We started yeah, we started, started selling yeah, off started. our our animals. We I mean, if you have any interest in learning about drought management, we have a whole discussion on that in a previous episode. Um, but we started selling off coal cows um, and trying to get rid of as many bulls as many as possible. bulls as possible. We got rid of some steers um, and right around when that was all lined up and and happening, it just out of nowhere began to rain and we've gotten like ten inches of rain in in the past yeah. week. Um, it's, it's not been, 12. It's been insane. Yeah, it's like um, eight in one day. So the average for June is probably pretty normal, but it happened in like <laughs> the <laughs> span of days, one yeah. week as opposed to an entire <laughs> month, um, which we're thankful for. We're not complaining, but it's just sort of a really weird weather situation. Um, but anyway, the big the big thing we've been dealing with recently is, is, is an outbreak of pink eye. Um, and we talked a little bit about that in one of our previous episodes, but it definitely has, it definitely escalated. Um, escalated to a point where Greg felt the need that, you know, we needed to address it and, and do something about it. And so, so we did, and we doctored a lot of animals and, um, the whole, the herd, whole herd, everything that had pink eye, we doctored, we doctored, um, and, and ran everybody through the shoot, all the cows and all the bulls. It was a marathon of a day. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. but we got through it and it sort of wrecked us for the rest of the week, but you know, <laughs> like just, it's just part of it. Um, that we, whole the whole week was last it, week was just last week was just crazy. Lot. Just a lot of stuff going on. Um, we 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 ground meat for several hours. You know, for people who have been following we along, a, we had a cattle drive. We had a cattle drive. We had a cow get out. out. We had a cow get out. <laughs> we had a blind cow. We were chasing around. Yep. Yeah, we have a blind bull. We're still chasing around. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, just you know, never a dull moment. I guess is one way to put it. But it also means we're we're sort of jumping from one thing to the next thing to the next and there's not a lot of time to just sort of like take a breath and appreciate what's going on you know because you just sort of feel like you're treading water like just just Mm -hmm. about to keep just keeping your head up you know um but i feel like like you guys were starting to allude to we're getting we're sort of getting on that that downhill slope at this point where Mm -hmm. calving is starting to drop drop off off. the hopefully this pink eye thing will will resolve itself itself or you know our our efforts will hopefully yeah. you know result in some some improvements which we sort of have already started to see i feel like we're also putting the bulls in to the mob yep. this week so that'll mm-hmm. drastically decrease our workload. our workload as far as chores are concerned um right now chores is basically our workload yeah it I pretty mean, much takes us most of the day that chores and setting up fence and yep. tearing down fences it, it takes up we have no time to do anything other than direct things that are directly related to the well-being of the herd which you know, it, it is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. But just like anything, there's seasons. Yeah, there's a rhythm to it, and, and it'll shift in the next coming coming months or whatever. So, um, just you know, part of the part of the whole deal. There so, was times last year where chores took thirty minutes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Can you <laughs> imagine that? Time? I don't think we've had a day where chores no. took less than two hours. I don't think I don't think it will be a thing. For a while. In no, Talk I don't think it'll ever. I don't think it'll ever be a thing until until the until all the dogs get sold. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um. That's the that will always be a constant, and mm-hmm. that adds another at least thirty minutes to the 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 the, the daily routine. Um, yeah. So the thirty minutes was more when like they were close to like, yeah. Their sheep sheep place. removed if they were like around North Place unroll a wire. That was the only thing you had to do. Go out there, um, make sure they're good. Make sure they're good. Yep. Yeah, exactly. But. We'll get there. Yeah, that'll be like August yeah. by the time that happens. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, we got you got any, we got any activity in the chat or people just yeah. There's some there questions listening. and stuff. All right, All right. Yeah. Let's start. Let's, let's start. Let's start, start ro- rocking and rolling here. See where this goes. Stir it's water is so warm. So warm. <laughs> You might have to pour it out. Go get some more. I hate lukewarm water. It's oh. all right. It's good for hydration. Alrighty, we'll just start from the top. <laughs> How do you manage young heifers in the mob? Do you worry about them getting bred at a young this age? This is a good question. <clears throat> so, you wanna you wanna take a stab at? Actually, it's kind of relevant because the yeah. heifer that we had. So all the heifers that are gonna be you know kept as as replacement heifers just remain in the mob. Um, they're not weaned. We don't wean any. 
heifers, you know, from from their mothers, for which a lot of people do. Um, we do wean the bulls. We'll wean the bull calves when they're they have to be over seven months on March first is when is, and we'll pull everything over seven months old. Um, that's just to you know keep our calving window from April 1st to November. Mm -hmm. um, so we pull them March 1st and that just, you know, we'll wean the bull calves, but the heifers just stay in with the mob. And uh, they'll, uh, there, there's definitely some heifers that'll be bred. I can think of a few off the top of my head. Yep. Like there's a heifer that calved last year that she had kind of a smaller calf and he kind of got scours for a little while. And he got better. And he got better. And then she actually bred back. She, she was a bitty little heifer, 887. Yeah. So she was, like a late born 2018 calf yeah. who calved in, you know, like mid summer of 2020. So, so she was she essentially like a 2019, like, yeah. you know, like calving so in she 2020. Was, she, was, yeah. she was basically like a year, in a bit. Like, like 15, 18 months maybe. Yeah. 15, 18 months, somewhere around there when she calved. And it definitely was hard on her, but then she actually bred back and she calved earlier. The other the other day, yeah, she yeah. She, she, she moved up, up yeah. from when she calved last year, yeah. and so um, she's doing fine. She is a smaller heifer, but she's built well. Um, and there was a heifer uh, to today this yep. morning, or probably either yeah. Either today you know, no. or There's a heifer today. this morning that we saw that calved. We can't find her calf, and we can't tell if she's taking care of it. So we're kind of kind of just but, like waiting waiting to see what's what's gonna happen yeah, um but she was bred last i remember the day i remember seeing her get bred um last summer so she's a 975 so that's a late born 2019 calf she was bred like late summer 2020 she's not i mean she's small she's right not yeah more than so like, she's just coming on like she might not even be two yet. Yeah. She's kept, I mean, she's she can't be. Two she can't yet. be two, but, you, but she she's the same deal. She's probably like 15, 18 months somewhere yeah. in there. Um, and she's a bitty little thing. She's probably what like seven hundred pounds, six hundred pounds, six hundred fifty, seven hundred yeah. pounds somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah. She's um, a small little heifer. And when you get like obviously you can have calving problems when they're that little. That's yeah. that's that's a concern. But even if they do have the calf totally fine. Most of the time, the calf is going to be really scrawny and won't really fill out if it's a bull or won't really fill out if it's a heifer. And so it, they end up either being steers. The calves that usually end up be either being steers or, or call heifers, basically. Um, so, you don't, the reason, like the question is asked in the first place is because you don't really want that to happen. So, like, why wouldn't you wean, right? Is sort yeah. of the question. Like, what's the benefit of being able to leave them in there? Mm -hmm. And like, why would you even consider doing that? You know what I mean? So the, 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 I would say the biggest thing is the, you don't have an extra herd yep. moving around your farm. That's just huge on your recovery period. If it was just for that, like it'd be worth it. But there's yep. also benefits to leaving them in, in that. And we've seen this, the females, yeah. they have that family dynamic oh, in, yeah. the, in the herd. And we'll see. A mother with her daughter, with her with the the daughter's daughter, with the daughter's daughter, it's like all great great granddaughter, yeah, like four, yeah. gen four yeah. generations of heifers, all standing next to each other because they still know, you know, they still have that connection with each other, um, and so when you wean, you break a lot of that, and that just produces a lot of stress, and uh, it's just you know they I think they remain a lot more healthy when you can keep that yeah. family dynamic together or that you know yeah. I guess it'd be family. there's there's also like the 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 fact that on on a, on a gra in a grass based system they're sexually they're not going to mature as quickly mm -hmm. so we're, like we're we're mentioning some some heifers off the top of our head that we can think of that you know calf when they were too young but it is by far the minor the minority that are extremely young mm -hmm. like there'll be there'll be heifers that I mean we don't wean them and they'll still be bred at two calf at three you mm -hmm. know um, which. I think Greg would prefer them to be older and more physically mature. Yeah, but then I was thinking of like that eight eighteen, like yeah, you know, she calved last year as a two year old. Yeah, and she and she's calving again this year. She's bred back just yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah, just yeah. Ideal, exactly. You know? But like, there's but there's a whole spectrum. Right. Like, you yeah, got yeah. you have two. You have like you know yeah, bred bred at like eighteen months and then calving before they're three. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You have bred at a year and 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 calving at two. It's there's sort of a whole spectrum. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the minority are ones that are super young that end up getting bred. Yeah, for um, sure. And so 
it like the, like it's not really a huge problem. It's yeah. not something that I thought it was gonna be more of a problem than yeah. it actually was. Like yeah. when like when I first thought you know when we first had this discussion on these yeah. two in the cuts, I was like I don't know, it'd almost be worth you know leaving them out or taking them out you know let wait until two. But it's like from what I've seen, the the benefit of having the one heard and a lot of them have been performing their second year. You yeah, know, it's not like it's not like they're missing a cat. Uh, yeah. You know, a year of calving so the other the other thing to consider too is that mother through the winter is having to nurse a calf and so it helps them not just balloon up like in yeah. in, in, in when there, there's a problem with like mothers when they get weaned and you have excellent management where it's like oh, it's almost like too much of a good thing where the cow will put on a ton of weight and then doesn't breed back very well has some calving issues or whatever because she's just got so much excess fat um and a way to avoid that is to stress them a little bit and the way you can stress them a little bit even with good management by not is by, by not weaning not because lactation is just incredibly demanding on the on the mother even if it's a little bit of milk it's still requires a lot of energy for them to produce that in, in so, the winter time especially, especially in the winter time when you know the feed value is a lot lower um another benefit to the not weaning especially during the winter is that heifer that's a yearling she's not quite mature enough to where you could take her through the winter on purely stockpiling hay and not lose a lot of um like condition growth potential her, yeah growth and, and condition on her so by not weaning and letting that heifer suck on her mom all winter long, that's like giving her, like a lot of people will grain their heifers during the winter time or their their yearlings just just to keep because you like the, they need that extra protein and that extra energy um, to get through the winter and so not weaning allows them to get that from their mother's milk and so you don't have to provide those costly inputs to your to your yearlings. There would be like less than half a dozen heifers that will end up putting weaning rings into. Um, and that's when the mother doesn't wean is, is either too slow at weaning the weaning the calf or weaning the heifer calf from last year or or isn't really interested in weaning the heifer calf from last year and so then you have a problem where you have a 500 pound heifer suckling on a on a freshly you know produced udder freshly produced udder like for the calf that just dropped on the ground and the little weak calf is like trying to get some milk and it's getting butted out of the way by this 500 pound 600 pound heifer so when that happens we'll just get them up put a one of those weaning rings which is it's just a plastic people aren't familiar it's just a plastic nose ring that has little spikes on the end of it and it doesn't stick to their nose it just it's like a, yeah. it's got a little gap and so you just slide it up on there and it just holds itself you just tighten it so that it can't like slide out mm -hmm. essentially but their, their nose has a little like almost it's like a T. It's like your nose, like kind of. Yeah, it's yeah. like a T shape. So it like yeah. just slip it over the T and it just holds itself there. Yeah. If, if, if that makes sense. And so when the, the that that ringed heifer comes up to take a take a drink from her mother, those little spikes just poke the teat, and the mother just is like, "What the heck is that?" And like kicks <laughs> the crap out of whatever just did that. And so they they like learn really quickly. Like I don't want to go in because mom's just kicking the crap out of me, mm -hmm. and it works. We we definitely have seen. I don't think I've seen a heifer with a weaning ring actively stealing milk. I don't still. think they can. Yeah, it's hurt too much. Yeah. Those things are yeah. pokey. Yeah, it's like sticking a briar up on her. And her we'll whatever. and like we'll leave. Stone. You gotta be careful when you put them in there because if they're flailing around like this and you like hold on to the weaning ring and they flail, like they can jab right in your hand. Mm -hmm. But um, the we we leave them in for I don't know sometimes. Six months, six months, like or longer, and we don't. I wouldn't really, need it that long. But no, but it's, it's just, yeah, can, it's just convenience. Though. Yeah, and and I've heard people's comment, you know, like you got to get those things out because otherwise it causes infection or like irritation of their nose or whatever. But I mean, we've had them in on some some cows for the better part of a year, and it seems to be fine. Like it, I don't I don't notice any serious issues with you know their nose or them not being able to eat or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But. It's just something you gotta watch for, but that's and like you said, it's only like less than like a do half a dozen or whatever. Yeah, it's. I mean, right now I think what we've got two, two, two three, 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 maybe three. in the whole herd. Yeah. So, um, and sometimes there'll be an older cow that does it too, and same deal. Mm -hmm. You just, you know, get her up and put a ring in her nose, and that that's that solves the problem. So, that that was a good question though. I saw a video of a cow stealing her own milk. What? <laughs> she reached her head back around and was sucking under her own udder. That I don't know if that's good so or like. I don't, not good. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like, it, how would 
Because, like, she, she used the energy to boost the milk to then drink the energy to, it's like, what? You don't want you to gotta lose some energy. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta get rid of her. You gotta get rid of her. That is an inferior trait. Weird. I've ever seen one. I don't know. <laughs> what the heck? Isn't that so strange? It's so strange. It's so weird. Learn that. If you've ever experienced that, leave <laughs> it in the comments below. I want to hear what's going on. Oh, that's bizarre. Oh, man. Isn't that so weird? That is the weirdest thing I've heard in a while. Oh, so something weird. about that is so uncomfortable. I know. <laughs> For real? Jeez. <laughs> oh, uh, have you ever had problems with lambs getting dehydrated? My Saint Croix lambs seem to be getting dehydrated on hot days. They choose when they choose not to sit under their shade shelter. Hmm. I can't think of pretty much all the paddocks that we had the sheep in have some kind of woods. shade. Yeah. And a lot of times, some in the you know. Middle of the day, they'll go up underneath the shade. Yeah, they we I don't know we we don't take enough pay enough yeah. attention to the sheep. To notice. Yeah, um, but I mean they seem to be we doing right in water in the summer and you know in the spring, summer, and fall. And in the winter, they don't get water. They don't need water in the as winter, long as they're water. grazing stockpile. But well, I guess we had water from when we were feeding hay too. Yeah, in the former ponds. We yeah, didn't, like actively set out a tank or anything. No. And there were some scenarios where, like, they couldn't access it, but the dogs could. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they're but, tough. Yeah, they're they're super tough. I mean, if something doesn't perform, it gets it gets cold out of the flock. So yeah, I don't know what I, we we haven't experienced that. No. Maybe if I mean, if if the whole flock has to go to the water in order for the lamb to drink, it might you know that might be why they're getting dehydrated. Is they're not going to yeah. go on their own. Yeah. Unless you maybe try set, getting the water closer to their shade or something. Yeah. But you the know, but if they're laying in the sun. If I don't the know. lambs are drinking milk though, do they even need water? I'm sure they do. They probably, probably need a little bit. Quickly, yeah. You know, after. Yeah. I mean, a month old or something. They yeah. They, they can't be drinking that much water though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a little lamb, I can't imagine. But yeah, I don't know. That's the first I've heard of that. Um, but you're right. We we have shade and the sheep paddocks have a lot of trees in it compared to except for up on Colic. You know, by Steve's Corral, but those still yeah, have Yeah, but they still have trees. Yeah, there's, there's always at least a little bit of shade. Or they can go down sort of towards the creek or whatever and, and cool yeah. off. Yep. Not in the water, but, you know, just like it's cooler because the sheep won't get in the water. They don't like it. But, you know, down in the on the creek bank, it's a lot cooler than it is up in the middle of the baking sun. So, mm -hmm. interesting, though. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. If anybody else has experienced that, you know, let us know. I never thought of that before. Um, have you ever heard of cows not doing well on reeds, canary grass, P potential alkaloids slash tannins? I it, what's funny is like I've I've heard that I've heard that you know other people have, are having a lot of trouble have a lot of trouble with their cows eating reeds, canary. Our the Greg's cows absolutely flatten it every the, time they go into the a thing paddock is, where it's though, there. Is it's so vegetative. Yeah, and it gets real woody they don't like it as much yeah which we never see that because they never always, see it there's not enough reeds canary back home when i went home there's yeah. like it's like 30 percent reeds canary everywhere, which is crazy yeah but um yeah i don't know i mean i could it's probably doesn't have quite the the nutrient density that like you know other yeah. forages have like it probably is kind of washing that alkaloid deal i, I don't i don't, I don't yeah. remember i know with like was it johnson grass or whatever yeah. there's there's something with yeah, with Johnson grass, it's after it's after like a first frost. Ten days after a fr first frost or something, you don't yeah. want to graze it for ten days because it's got like a a toxin in it. Mm -hmm. um, but with the reeds canary, it's like we turn them into a paddock and they will flatten it to the dirt. They will eat eat it off. Like there'll be patches of it because it's not it's you know small patches of where it's sort of wet. They'll m mow that thing as short as possible, and then everything around it's grazed nicely. But mm -hmm. it's like you. It's like you took a wee whacker and went straight to the dirt, just mm -hmm. went and like got yeah. rid of it every time. Um, so then it grows up you hit, you more vegetative, vegetative yeah. which is what it is. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would think it's probably just because it's, you know, pretty. Once it gets pretty woody and then, because it, 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 it gets much. pretty stemmy. Yeah. Um, and tall. That's that's my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, does Joel send cattle out to the Wyoming area? I'm assuming you mean Greg, but... Yeah. Greg, he's, he's sent cattle out west before. Yeah. Um, Utah. Utah. Um, 
they, Washington State. Washington State, yeah, Eastern Washington. Washington. Um, in general, I think they do. It, it's a lot easier moving an animal from the east to the west because it's a lot harder for an animal to perform out here than it is out there, which is sort of counterintuitive for the most. Is a sweeping generalization, but like <laughs> for the most part, because you're dealing with a lot lower palatability of grasses, a lot more parasites, a lot more here in the yeah east. here in the east, a lot more a lot a lot more washy more, grass, worse worse fly loads, like you know, th- like high you know protein like like clover swords and stuff like that that are just like tough for them to deal with and so if you have an animal genetically that's in epigenetically that's thriving in this kind of environment and then you ship them out west where there's very little parasites the grass is incredibly nutrient dense and mineralized there's not um there's not like you know tons of like that leguminous sword or whatever that's going to sort of upset their their stomach or whatever um generally they just do absolutely fantastic moving them out west the thing is if an animal is adapted to here, they're going to have a big gut because they need to eat a lot of forage in order to get yep. the amount of nutrients that they need to survive. And so when you take them out there, it takes a, since the grasses are so mineralized, it takes a lot less forage in order to fill them up. And so since they have that big gut, it's really easy for them to get full and, and, and they do phenomenal out there. That's why they do phenomenal. Whereas out there, they don't need as much you know, grass because it's so nutrient dense, so their stomachs are smaller. So if you bring them out here where they have to eat that big volume of grass, their stomach, they're they're physically not built enough, you know, big enough to yeah. handle the amount that they need to consume in order to do well, and so they just they just suffer. They just start to melt. They can't eat enough. But there's always that being said, there's always a risk with mm-hmm. especially taking an animal to a completely different environment like that. There's always a risk with you know, it's just it's just a lot of change all at once, and so you know something could happen, and the animal just doesn't doesn't perform the way it should. Um, you're, you're definitely a better chance going east to west as opposed to west to east. But again, if you can figure out a situation where you could buy an animal that's adapted to the environment already or close to it, you know, if you can find somebody producing something that is doing really well, like if you're in Wyoming, that's doing really well in Wyoming, in your area of Wyoming, I would start looking at that first and then maybe looking to like cycle in maybe some some South Pole genetics or, or whatever into it if you really wanted to try that. But I would, I'd look local first and then start, you know, branching out because you're just, you're just going to be, you're going to already capture a lot of that sort of epigenetic adaptation, so to speak. Um, you have a higher chance, I guess, but there's still differences. Like Greg's bought animals from, you know, what hundred miles or less like away from here and brought them onto the farm and they've just absolutely melted and it's just because you know this little area of rucker has a particular you know soil type or particular style of management with greg or whatever that they're just not used to and that change is is just not they're not able to adapt it's mm-hmm. just a risk whenever you buy livestock so mm-hmm. just thought i'd throw that one out there um yeah um can you use herbicide as a crutch and not hurt soil pH? pH. Um, I'll say this. This is the, the spiel that Greg always gives about crutches. Is that you can, in the beginning, it's okay to use crutches sparingly as long as you don't become married to them in order to like get you started. So, and he, usually he's not referring to herbicides. Usually he's referring to Lime soil process. amendments. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the herbicide game is a dangerous one to play because you're, I understand the fact that like there are some super like invasive, noxious weeds out there. Like we've got Ceresia lespedeza. That's mm-hmm. one that, you know, basically grazing is hard to control. It. Yeah. It's really difficult to control with grazing. Um, I understand there are weeds like that out there, but for the most part, like from the ecosystem's perspective, there's a reason that that plant is there. Like there's a, there's a niche in the environment that that plant is filling and maybe it can be filled with something that's more palatable and it's starting to get a foothold, but everything should be communicating to you. Some, something in that environment is lending itself to let that express. And so if you can manage your grazing and, and, and other avenues and factors that are contributing to the presence of that noxious plant in such a way that it becomes inhospitable for that plant or if you're grazing it or you know trampling it or whatever at a weak point in its life cycle or something like that you can like use your management to shift to shift the the 
um, the hosp the hospitality, so to speak, of like the ecosystem for that particular species. And so, and maybe it looks like increasing the hospitality for the other plants to then crowd it out. Yeah, you know, which is basically yeah, yeah. The, the, there, there's a lot of like potential solutions down that avenue, but it's the her the herbicide um the herbicide like solution I, is I have a hard time with it. Yeah, I do too because it's 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 you're you're treating the symptom as opposed to the cause, if that makes any sense. Like it's like, oh my leg hurts, I'm gonna take an Advil or ibuprofen or whatever, you know what I mean? Or and in reality, like the reason your leg hurts is because <laughs> is like is because I don't know, like you know, you just you just walked like 15 miles you or whatever, your knee on the or you cracked your knee on the corner of the table or whatever, you know what I mean? It's you like, have cracked your knee on the corner yeah, of the table in the first place, or you so didn't, don't do it next or time. You didn't, <laughs> you know? Yeah, or like you didn't stretch or whatever, and so like you're not getting really sore, and so instead of just like making sure like, oh, maybe I should stretch, or maybe I should like get in better shape before I walk 17 miles, you know what I mean? Like there are other things where you can sort of treat the root cause of the reason why you're ex experiencing that pain as opposed to just like treating the pain itself. But this is getting to a whole other discussion about like holistic medicine, but it's, you know, it's essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're, you're trying to diagnose, you know, a symptom of the ecosystem. And so why would you just prescribe medication, so to speak, instead of like treating the lifestyle cause of that symptom, you know, mm -hmm. um, and medication is essentially herbicides. And in that case, that being said, we do use a little bit of a yep. brush killer. That's basically the only like chemical that we use yep. on the farm as far as like brush control and what we do is when we cut brush or you know in like a fence row or in a like a new silver pasture area or something all we do is we just paint the stumps with it's one quart of crossbow to five gallons of red diesel fuel and so that's like we will use that you know to control brush but that's not like a Spray, spray. You know, we don't go around spraying and we don't you know spread it around a lot so it's just a spot we're not saying like yeah you know yeah, it's not like you know. We're not like you know reprimanding you for you know or like telling anybody like you, don't, you can't use herbicides you can't use or whatever. Just be very it's just cautious. Gonna be, with yeah, it. you have to be cautious of your application. I would never use an herbicide in a pasture yeah. situation. Um, I wouldn't either, especially a synthetic herbicide. Mm -hmm. um, like you know, in a pasture situation to control a pasture weed, um, mm -hmm. that would never. I would never do that. the The only scenario would be like you know clearing fence rows or whatever and mm -hmm. trying to mitigate control brush control brush um and and really all you're doing in that scenario is just buying yourself time mm -hmm. because if you if you chainsaw something down or you lop it off or cut it or whatever and you paint it you're preventing that individual plant from sprouting but like those plants are going to continue to grow in that area and so you will eventually have to do it again until it's, you change the yeah until you change the environment which will never really happen in a fence row so it's just sort of it's yeah. like it's just it's just you sort of have to weigh your options because your your option is I clear the fence every seven years or so if I paint the stumps or I clear the fence every other year because I don't paint anything. So if you don't have a lot of acreage, it might like it might just be like a relatively simple maintenance deal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if you have then you wouldn't have miles. To, I don't like using cross. No, I don't either. It sucks. The it's, fact of using yeah. you know saving that much time, it's it's worth it. I think. Um, I'm not even sure really where I stand with the whole thing necessarily, but I think like it's yeah. it's it's definitely something to like think about and consider, you know, because at the end of the day, like you are putting you are putting an herbicide into the ecosystem, even if yeah, it is like a small application, but at the same time you are saving yourself years Lots worth of time, time and hours and hours and hours. Um so Again, like everything, there's no straight answer, but you just got to be cautious when you're using synthetic fertilizers or synthetic anything going into the environment just mm -hmm. because there's like a ripple effect of that chemical getting broken down and metabolized into that ecosystem. And it's very, very difficult to predict the trickle down effects of introducing that into the system. So mm -hmm. you just got to be careful. And the more you use, the more severe those consequences can be yeah but what is your mineral program like um it's sort of a loaded question for those who are <laughs> for those who have been keeping score so to speak um in general we'll i say this that the the free choice is sort of like the the flagship of the mineral program um we've been using free choice enterprises greg has for years and years and years um and that's a 
you know, cafeteria style mineral where the cattle can choose one of 16 different minerals to um, eat. And the theory is, you know, they know what they need. And so they're going to consume the minerals accordingly. And part of that mineral gets defecated onto the ground and then helps remineralize the soil. And so their consumption will decrease over time of all the minerals until ultimately you've got only a select few that, you know, the land's deficient in and the rest of it they're getting from the grasses. Um, that's the theory, so to speak. Whether or not it, it works that effectively is is still sort of up for debate. And that's like the reason why we've been monkeying around with the mineral program this year to varying, to limited success, I should say. Um, yeah. We've tried, we were basically, we've been trying to get more marine like minerals in them more like um in the form of better quality higher quality salts um and to see if that's gonna that was gonna help us with our pink eye problem which it definitely did not um and and then a little use of some apple cider vinegar which i mean they they enjoyed but it, it did like the whole system really didn't sort of we didn't see a, a, a big result and that could have been our fault for not sticking with it long enough before we changed it up um it also could have been the timing that we changed it up right before calving could have been an issue. Um, so there's a lot of variables. There's, a, there's too many variables to really isolate it. It's like I said, it's going to be a multi-year trial if you really wanted to zero in on what the heck's going on. Um, but I'd say that from the track record, free choice probably would be would be the the if you were to if you were to say like gun to, gun to the head like what's your mineral program? You know what I mean? Free choice. It's free choice. Free choice enterprises with like some some offshoots into some <laughs> other experimental mineral stuff, but um, yeah. And the sheep, Greg used to give salt to um, only, but as of two years ago, he they have their own free choice feeder, um, which we modified so it doesn't kill baby lambs. Um, but that's <laughs> yeah. a whole other story. And there's a video on Greg's YouTube channel about us doing that. Yeah, so. go check it out. Greg Judy, regenerative rancher. Uh, I sheep. Don't know what the name of it. I sheep, probably just looked up like mineral sheep mineral feeder. feeder or something like that. Come up. Um, another question about mineral: Is a fifty-pound mineral lake block sufficient, or do I need to add more minerals? Which brand do you recommend, and where can I acquire? Um, fifth, well, I mean, it, there's depends. a lot of questions. It, yeah, it depends on like how many, how many animals, animals, and, how many animals and. Um, how, and, I mean, what? how many head it's how and often what is it? Are, is it is it 50 head of sheep is there 50 pounds for sheep is it for yeah. cattle I'm assuming it's cattle um, but I mean it just you know the more head you have the quicker the sooner you're going to have to replace it yeah um, um, we I mean we'll give the cattle 50 pounds of salt at a time or whatever yeah know? like if we were like when we were doing the, the vinegar deal yep yeah. it's like 50 pounds of salt with a little bit of apple cider vinegar yep yeah. yep yeah. Um, I think if I was starting out, you know, and didn't have a ton of capital because free choice is incredibly expensive, yeah. I would just concentrate on like a good quality salt and a good quality like pre-mixed mineral yeah. um, and make sure that I give them um, a high mag mineral in the spring mm -hmm. and that's and, and maybe some Magnesium. and maybe some um, selenium as well, yeah. like around calving. Um, but other than that, that's what I would. That's what I would focus on because free choice is, is, is all well and good, but it is very expensive, and especially on a smaller scale, mm -hmm. it's not. I don't think economically worth it, especially since a lot of the mineral is that if you just are consistent with it, your animals will get used to it. And so if you stick, if you stick with whatever it is, as long as it's a you know reputable company or reputable Brand mineral brand, brand, yeah, um, yeah, there's another one. Um, I mean, Purina makes a ton of stuff, but like it's, it doesn't really matter what it is, but as long as like, you, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of vouching for it and people in the area are using it and having good results and like, there's no complaints or whatever. And it's, it'd be better also if it was mostly like made not in China. And that's the, that's not a, a knock on like anything to do with like China, China itself, but it's more that cheaper or like cost reduced, like mineral cost reduced mineral sourcing there can be a lot of like tainting going on with um cadmium and and others and other sort of stuff so um if you can find a if you can find a a, a a more reputable source for for the mineral sometimes that that can help but other than that just just good, get a reputable brand premixed mineral high mag and selenium in the spring slash during calving um and good quality salt 
That's what that's what maybe C ninety. Yeah, C ninety. You like you know, Canopolis, like in, Kansas. in in Kansas, like Independent Salt or whatever. Like that stuff is that stuff's also pretty good. Um, Redmond's, you know, mm-hmm. also good stuff. Something with a lot of trace minerals in it is what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, could you outline your steps of procedure in detail for setting up a paddock with poly braid? Thanks for all your help, guys. It's much appreciated. Setting up a paddock. Um, how do we want to tackle this? Like, <laughs> it depends on the paddock. It depends on the paddock. Um, I mean, the first thing, I guess the first thing we do before we even get out there which we don't do all the time because we've done it long enough now where we can eyeball it. But back in the beginning, it was really helpful to look at a map um, and and like, like look at a map and look at the forage that's available and get a bead on, all right, what do I have feed wise? You know what I mean? And how many splits am I gonna be able to get out of like this, this paddock? How many days, you know? Um, and then and once you sort of got it figured out like where you're gonna run your wire, like, I mean, the nuts and bolts of of actually putting it out is, is fairly simple. Yeah, so we, with our four-wheeler, yeah. we drive up to the one end, because all let's just talk about a paddock that's completely enclosed in high, one strand high tensile. So we'll drive to the spot we want to start splitting it. We've got a little slide out rack that holds the reel, yep. tightens down, you put the reel in, handle in there, and then you pull the, 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 the little uh, brain up braid out, tie it to a plastic handle, and we hook it on to the fence. The fence is hot at all times. And then one person is riding on the four-wheeler and he has a stack of posts right next to him. And so he can, you know, he can drive and throw posts. And then the other two are following behind. One person steps in the post, the other person hooks them on. And uh, we'll drive to the end of the paddock. And then once it's ready to, ready to go, we'll, we'll get the measurement, wrap the wire around the reel, and hook the reel on hot, making sure you're touching the insulated, insulated parts, of the, parts of the reel. <laughs> hook it on hot, and at that point, the reel's hot, and then we're good to go. So, yep. then to roll it up, we'll go to the, we'll drop one person off at the handle, then drive the other, the other two will go to the other end, and they'll make the reel cold, give the guy on the other end a tug so he can untie the, the handle, and he walks carrying, picking up posts on the way to the four wheeler while the other guy reels it. Yeah, so that's the way that's we, we do it. Yeah, take up and put down a fence. The the most like the hardest part to to get to understand and to get good at is the is the is the understanding like how much feed do I need to give them? Mm-hmm. And people like I've I've gotten questions about that all the time. Like how do you figure out, you know, how, how many acres to give them or whatever? And we don't count out you know, oh, we need to make sure we're giving them 6.5 acre paddocks every day. You know what I mean? Like, because it depends. On it depends on the quality. shape. Yeah, because it, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the shape of the field. It depends on the accessibility to water. It depends on the quality of the feed, what time of year it is, what their nutritional requirements are. Is there a lot of lactating cows? Is it a bunch of bulls? Is it, you know, like, anyway, it, it depends on a ton of factors. And so basically, like, as a rule of thumb, what you can do is give them what you think they would need, you know, for a day, however often you're moving them, every day, every other day, half a day, whatever it is, give them what you think they need in that paddock and then come back to move them and evaluate your height. If the grass is grazed a lot shorter than you wanted it to be, give them the 25%, 50% bigger area and evaluate again. Is the grass too tall? Is it too short? And you're going to start by monitoring your grass. You're going to start to understand, okay, this is about as big a paddock as I need to give them for, you know, in the springtime, you know what I mean? Or this is as big a pack as I need to give them in the winter to ration out stockpile. Mm-hmm. All those things are gonna come with just experience and, and, and looking and observing how the animals are performing and what the grass looks like. Because what's the worst you're gonna do? The yeah. other day you're gonna either, they're gonna be a little bit short on feed or they're gonna have way too much feed. And either one is not really that much of a problem, you know. Yeah. One, you, you maybe make them a little bit hungry, but then you're going to be moving them the next day anyway. So. And you can give them all they need to eat the next day. So. And the other one, maybe you wasted a little bit of forage, but next time it'll be there around when you come back around the farm. So you can yeah. raise it then. It's like people, it seems it seems a lot more high consequence in the beginning than it actually is. Like you think like, oh, I need to really make sure that I'm nailing the amount of forage that I'm giving them or whatever. And it's like, 
a very low risk, like low concern decision, basically. Yeah. You just, as long as you're paying attention. Yeah, because if you're rotating them, it's not like that's all the grass you have, you know? Like, yeah. you hit it, you leave, yeah. you let it recover, and you'll come back, and it'll be, it'll be fine. Yeah, so it's just about being observant. You can't you can't go out there, like, with your blinders on and just be like, I have to give them this number of paddocks every day or this size of paddock or whatever. You're going to you're gonna run into some issues if you start doing that. And that's it's a whole other topic, but that's sort of the reason why we don't use permanent paddocks. And, for the, like, by permanent paddocks, I mean, you know, single single move size paddocks like we have like already set already set like permanent wise like they're always the same every time whereas we've got these huge paddocks that are divided up and it's just so that like you can fence something without having to tie two reels together type deal um and that gives you a huge amount of flexibility to be able to vary paddock size depending on all those factors we were talking about um so yeah it's a whole other discussion but it's definitely it's more more complicated and requires more skill and thought and effort as far as planning it out as opposed to just opening a gate and letting them go in. Um, obviously, rotating via permanent paddocks is better than just set stocking, but temporary paddocks are going to be uh, like another step up from there as far as animal performance, land performance, um, flexibility, a lot of factors. So. The whole fencing discussion is a is a, is a rabbit hole in and of itself. You can just you can do a whole episode. There's a lot of these, those, these topics. Yeah, just <laughs> just go. Yep. Alrighty. <laughs> I had a goat drink her own milk during labor this year. <laughs> I actually have a video of it on my YouTube. <laughs> she was trying to get comfortable and realize her teat was right there. <laughs> she just couldn't resist. <laughs> that is so bizarre. <laughs> Oh, what is that? What is I've that? seen that before. Oh, it's weird. <laughs> oh, it tastes pretty good. <laughs> oh, it's so weird. Uh, oh, man. Something about it is just not right. That is not right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Greg mentioned a collab coming up with Joel Salatin. Will you guys take part in that? No. He's going to Virginia. We will be manning the fort. Um, it's actually at a Stockman grass farmer. Yeah. Um, conference or whatever it's a like homesteaders of america conference i don't remember what it's there's called. something about homesteader but something. stockman is involved with it or something Stockman's like that doing it. um but, uh, maybe. but there's a lot of big name speakers going to that mm-hmm. i think it's jim, jim garish, jim garish is, joel i'd like to hear greg um and a, like a handful of other people are going to be there um so there you go shout out to that in virginia <laughs> in august at some point i don't remember what the date is but we won't be involved september in Sep- yeah. September, yeah, yeah, sorry, not August. September 10th or something like that. Um, we'll be here. Manning the Fort, <laughs> per usual. Um, yeah, see. it'd be cool to be involved, but yeah, it would someone, cool someone's got to make this thing run. <laughs> yeah. We can't all five go. We can't all, all of us pack in down there, but yeah. yeah. That would be cool. Mm-hmm. Um, don't your sheep keep Sericea in check? The sheep don't eat it. Only when it's tender and yeah. young. And the cow, cows will eat it a little bit. And it's almost like it's like a medicinal plant in that regard. It actually will help offset some of the fescue toxicity. But it's like they'll take a bite of it every once in a while. They don't sort of actively graze it. And you can help control it a little bit if you can get the sheep to eat it when it's just coming up. When it's like this tall. Like just super vegetative and poking up. They'll eat it. But it's so hard to get the sheep where the Ceresia is exactly when you need to graze it when it's you know in all these different locations you can't you can't hit it all mm-hmm. um and the cattle will graze it too a little bit better when it's like that but it's a nasty plant it is it just it's insidious i think it was introduced for roadsides, uh, roadsides like to as like a cover plant or whatever and it just is taken started to take over um mm. it's not too bad here compared to some areas of Missouri, I think. Um, but it is it's starting to get bad. Up. It um, just spreads so easily. Yeah, There's so many seeds, mm-hmm. and they they're little hard seeds, so they spread. And they, you know, it's hard to yeah. They don't deteriorate. They just stay strong, and they get planted. Yeah, all over the place. Yeah, it's one of those nasty ones. But you just gotta, as Greg says, you just gotta concentrate on the good stuff. Mm-hmm. As long as you're managing for the good stuff, you know, which makes it that much harder for the bad stuff to get a foothold. But 
Seems like the Cerise has no problem. <laughs> I know, it's like it doesn't have a problem competing with it. Because it grows straight up first. Mm -hmm. yep. It grows straight up till it gets about 12, 14 inches and then it starts to branch out. Yep. So it's like putting all its energy into getting up above the grass. And it's got these little, like almost like square like leaves. Mm -hmm. A um, bunch of little solar collectors. Yeah. Just brrrr, and yep. then it'll just explode. Yeah. Nasty. Anyway. Um, with the addition of ponds, are you seeing more grass around ponds, even in drier times, because there's more water staying in the landscape? Um, I mean, some of the ponds have seeps in the in the dam, and you definitely see, you know, different kinds of grasses down there. Um, yeah, a lot of water. A lot of water, grasses, aquatic like grasses. Yeah. Um, we were noticing in that that in the when it was really dry for about a month, we were noticing in the shady spots there yeah. was active a, actually like. A lot of stuff was turning brown, but there was a lot of timothy and other sorts of grasses that were staying nice and green under the it shade because they makes, weren't just getting baked by the sun all makes day. Me think of the silver patch yeah. topic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, man. exactly. If don't that's the advantage, don't of, even get me the advantage of a simple pasture area, so you got all that de all that dis distributed shade. If you could get honey locust trees every thirty foot centers, yeah, then you'd have almost continuous shade. Throughout the paddock, but then there'd be it'd be dapple shades. You could still grow the grass. The yeah. grass would grow up better. The nitrogen fixation from the the honey the locusts would seed the grasses. Yep. And it'd be a good deal. You'd yeah. have shade for your livestock. You'd get your feed yep. for your from your honey locust pods. Yep. Yeah, your grass wouldn't wouldn't no, turn it, brown as much. It'd be a lot more res resistant, resistant to heat. To heat and drought. Yeah, it'd be cool. It's just establishing it is very tricky. It's yeah. a long time. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's something for the long haul. Yeah. yeah. Yep. If it's like a place that you know you're, you know, you're going to spend the rest of your life on, I definitely would. Me personally, I would start start doing it. Start, yeah. so start it as soon as possible because it yep. takes so long. <laughs> yeah. so long it's one of those things. Yeah. Yep. But it's also one of those things where you, keep, you don't really do it when you start out because it's not yeah. a lot of return. Yeah, you know but, I mean? but like, and it's like, expensive. Yeah, the camping think, too yeah. is like a year, two year, five years is all pretty similar as far as starting. Like, you yeah. know, like that's not going to make that much of a difference in the span of your life. So no. it's like, don't, don't think that like the first year you got to plant all your farm. Like, yeah, <laughs> spread it out. No, it's but also. If you can, I mean, yeah. not just honey locusts, there's no, all kinds of other Exactly. Trees. But like from a cash flow perspective, it's definitely like a long term oh, yeah. investment because it's not something you're going to see return on games wise or, or whatever in any meaningful period of time. I almost yeah. feel like the way to do it is kind of like how Greg's doing it in that anything like just picking selective trees that are coming up on their own. Yep. Don't even worry about fencing them off. And if they get broken over, they do. And you just cut them anyway. You yep. Know, just yep. The only whatever disadvantage, makes it, makes it. The only disadvantage to that is like if you wanted to plant thornless varieties, like you can't do that. But I don't have a problem with it. Right. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like I think the thorns are there for a purpose. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are hard on four wheel tires. So hard on four wheel tires. <laughs> but like at the same time, it's the reason why the tree is standing there mm -hmm. is because like it's an anti rub device. You know, um, you know, cows won't rub on it as badly if there's like thorns this long sticking out all over the yeah. place. That supposedly they don't, like the wild, honey, like honey locusts don't produce as many seed pods though. Yeah, that's oh, true. Yeah, that's yeah true. from a feed from, from a feed, feed perspective, perspective. Yeah. But you, just in the value of the shade alone, yeah. it would be worth it. Yeah, um, the feed's just the extra. This feed's just an added bonus. For sure. sure. Also grow more feed because there's more shade. Yep, in the form of grass. Mm -hmm. And when we say feed from honey locusts, we're talking about the, the actual seed yeah. pods. And some grazing too on the lower yeah, branches. Yeah, on the lower on, branches, yeah, the lower branches they like eating, they, yeah, it is browsing. They, they like eating those eating those leaves, those little tender leaves. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see cows all the time with their head up in the air. It's one of the only trees that they'll do that to. Um, I don't know. They do it to a lot. They but do they, like they don't, don't do it. They don't do it as much to oak, to oaks as they do with honey locusts. I feel yeah, like true. they always do one. Is the, the big one. The big one. I saw them chewing on those white pine needles the other day <laughs> up there. I was like, hey, what is going on? <laughs> it tastes good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's high in vitamin C. You can make tea out of that stuff. Really? Yeah, I used to do that all the time. Hmm. We have a lot of white pines at home though, compared to here. Mm -hmm. Um, I think here it's pretty much planted. It's yeah, pretty much. Grows really well. Yeah, there's not. I don't think it really any. It's just escaped. I think it's just escaped like horticultural mm -hmm. um, trees or whatever. But there's some huge ones on jacks. Yeah, but the, but those were definitely planted. Those are right in a fence row. But the I'm, I'm thinking about this is totally irrelevant to like everybody <laughs> who's behind this camera. But 
when you when you're taking the back way to Jan's and you go like up and like and down and you're going oh, yeah. that way there's like down in those I pointed them out before like down off the road a little ways like where that core like old quarry used to be like those those coal pits that Greg used to talk about like, like across like the left. opposite no the no 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 the back way to Jan's like if you go past McBee's and, oh, and yeah. down that way there's there's the um like you know that pond he talks about that like you oh, go, yeah, yeah, but then yeah, on yeah, the yeah. other side of the road a little bit farther down mm-hmm. there's sometimes a camper like way the hell back in the trees back there mm-hmm. there's huge white pines back over there mm. i i bet they were planted from like a home site or something like that a long time ago but those are the biggest ones that i've seen around mm-hmm. here at least that one on jacks is pretty big yeah, those, yeah the guy's house yeah, yeah yeah but anyway sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah trees are so cool i know so cool Oh, um, what, what have precipitation levels been like there from Eastern <laughs> Iowa and we are finally out of a, about a month of close to drought conditions. Yeah, nothing, 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 like all of a sudden there were these huge thunderstorms that just popped out of nowhere in four inches, like wham. Overnight. Overnight. It was actually like four to six or something like that overnight. And then the next, and then the next day like it was three. another three to four. Yeah, and then the day after that it was another three. And then it was like, we've gotten maybe like an inch like since since then just little drizzles and like mm-hmm. like spurts of rain or whatever. So it's crazy. The whole next week is all. And yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of moisture in the forecast. There's not a lot of clear days for this next week. Yeah. Um, Today was pretty clear. Yeah, it was. It's one of the it clearest days we've had. Yeah. Um, Which is crazy because, like, like we said earlier, like we were essentially going into drought mode, and we we're like, we got to get rid of animals. Yeah. And then that happens. Yeah. So. It's crazy. Just weird. Like very temperamental. Mm-hmm. You got almost drought, and then like more water than you can know what to do. Like with. we said, we were literally. Yeah. You know, enacting our drought plan. Yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. starting to sell cows. You got almost a foot of rain. Um, is there any information about who bought cattle from Greg in Eastern Washington? I would rather find South Pole to cross with Corriente with South Pole than build a Red Angus Corriente composite, being that I am from Eastern Washington. There's, I don't know the guy in Utah. Name. I don't know what the guy's name is. That's more South. Um, I don't remember. It was one guy and like email Greg. Email Greg and ask if because he would know. And he has the records and contact info and stuff like that. Um, I don't know what the guy, like, what his situation was or what he was using it for or whatever. I don't remember any of that. Um, I just remember he was in Eastern Washington because he drove all the way here. <laughs> was that a bull or was it a bailing roller? Um, no, it was, um, it was the, it the was, dog. no, 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 it wasn't the dog. It was the, um, you remember last year. Well, we had that that heifer, that Dave heifer, and like another bull. Oh yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, went nine, over to Washington. Nine something. Nine. Yeah, that was shipped out to Washington. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was Eastern Washington or Central or whatever, but it was definitely Washington State. Yeah, I remember that. That was a long time like ago. The, though. The that kid, was like because like the heifer was for the kid because the kid saved up yeah. and bought the heifer. Yeah, yeah. And then he he also bought like whatever five heifers. That was like. Sp- ring of like we literally were here for like a, like a month or two and like that started to happen yeah um that was a long time ago that was but yeah there's definitely somebody out there that has self pull for sure you have to talk to greg and i mean greg gets a gazillion emails a day so i know it's kind of hard to get in contact with him sometimes but he does his best um White pine is good for respiratory ailments and congestion. Mm-hmm. The tea, tea clears your sinuses. Buckley's uses white pine oil and tar in their formula. Maybe the cows chewing white pine needles for self-medicating. Yeah, could have been for the um, <laughs> pink eye or whatever. But, yeah, I used to, I was super into wild edible plants for the longest time. Still am. I think it's so cool. But, yeah, back when I was younger. When you know what I want to do? I do that all the time. I want to try to take chicory, chicory, chicory root, yeah. dry it and make like chicory tea make or coffee. Coffee, or yeah, because it, it used to be a substitute for coffee. Yeah. Yep. 
I've heard it does taste very good. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I want to like try it. it though. Yeah. You know, just to, just yep. to do it. <laughs> anyway, Ben and I are on a coffee. Yeah, we're coffee we're kit. spoiled by our our, our man, Mister Ted. Um. Anyway, that's another it's another story it's completely. Plug. Yeah. Thank you, Paul Ted. Ted. If you're out there, we appreciate. Yeah, appreciate appreciate it significantly. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've I've thought about that too. It'd be kind of cool. But yeah, I, I've I've I've, I've seen it. some people who have who have tried it before, and they're like, it's not that good. But, <laughs> but I mean, like it couldn't have been. I mean, they were in dire straits back then. Right, like, they, had coffee was a, their, they had to have their coffee. They would cut like they would cut coffee with chicory to yeah. make it last longer. They yeah. mix the two of them together. Coffee was like a hard to get but yeah really, really desired yep <laughs> they would like use the same coffee grounds for like yeah eight ten brews or yeah whatever. or whatever yeah just, just absolutely yeah nothing you know, left yeah anyway coffee's a wonderful thing i know you disagree but you know i mean <laughs> yeah i'm just not a fan of yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm not trying to start <laughs> maybe it maybe won't convert him no, I don't think so. There's no, no way. Yeah. Back the first time when we were coffee's one of those things that's so do, so like you either it's like binary. it or you don't. Yeah, you either like it or you don't. I know people who like the smell of it, but I don't like the well, taste. I love the smell of it. Yeah. But I just it's too bitter for me. Like yeah. I don't know. You I mean, like what seventeen is. pounds of sugar. Yeah. Like if I oh, I mean because I've had like yeah. you know the frappuccino or whatever mm-hmm. from like starbucks and that's like yeah i can drink this so like, no, like the carrot the the yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a milkshake it's not coffee, it's not coffee. <laughs> yeah exactly so i don't i say i don't like coffee i like yeah, yeah, sugar yeah. the coffee flavor is fine but you just don't like the bitterness associated with it yeah 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 because i can i can drink it if there's enough sugar in it but yeah. i'm not going to drink that because there's so much sugar consciously yeah. wise <laughs> yeah, it's it's i wouldn't drink it if i had to load up that much sugar yeah but anyway, this is all. Human, <laughs> but whatever. Well, it was good because we were out of questions, so yeah. we were just making it's time. Pretty, you pretty know. good time. <laughs> yeah, we got we got one good one, um, one more, something like that, and then we'll wrap it up. Last question. Yeah, yeah, this one's good. Or maybe two more, whatever. It um, is. Does Greg take part of the cost of cost share programs for water and pens provided by state good and federal Good question. Funding? That's a good question. So for people who don't know, you wanna. He has. You know, I know, but like, do you want to elaborate on like, oh, you know, cost, cost sharing, like what so, the deal is? So yeah, the NRCS, the Natural Natch, Natural Resources Conservation Service. I was like, is it NAS, or yeah. National or Nat- no, natural, natural Resource Conservation well, uh, Service? Yeah. Natural Resources Conservation Service is a uh, is a program for you know pretty much anybody that's wanting to get into. It's a nationwide. Yeah, deal. it's a nationwide yeah. deal. Anybody that's you know wanting to conserve their natural resources. Um, what they do is they do a lot of like fu- funding for different programs that they've they've worked through and, and things being like water or fencing for like rotational grazing or you know different kind of like maybe planting trees I'm sure they do a lot of like grants for that stuff like that that you know that's helping did he I think he drove that all the way over there yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> Any sense to anybody? <laughs> oh, oh my it's goodness. not even worth trying to explain. <laughs> uh, where were we at? Natural yeah. Resources Conservation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, get it together. <laughs> what happened was Greg was mowing over here. He mowed the yard, and then we like he left like, and so we started this whole deal because I was waiting for you know the yard to be done mowed mowing, and. And then just now, we just look up, and he's driving the mower down the driveway. So he was like, he, we were saying he probably drove it all the way to Steve's. Is what or, you were saying. Or, Scott Scott or all the way up to Scott House. <laughs> either way. Either way. Steve's is like a mile away from here, and the Scott House is like all the way up and around the corner, like a quarter mile yeah. or whatever. He's, he's driving the he's zero turn trailer, down. Is it? Yeah, he drove the zero turn down the road. <laughs> it's just a funny image. Anyway. Anyways. Yeah. Um. Um. Yeah. Maybe he. Maybe he didn't. But that's where we're laughing. No, he about. definitely did. Yeah. Oh. I mean, he wouldn't have been sitting up here the whole time. Oh. Anyway. 
the NRCS basically does cost share on, I don't on know, all kinds of different all kinds of different programs, and so they'll pay for a certain percentage of it, or they'll pay if if you provide the labor, Dig they'll, a pond. they'll they'll pay you to like to as as the labor for putting you know putting in the fence or whatever. Um, especially starting out, Greg used a bunch of that with um, with his water infrastructure and his fencing and whatnot. The only thing you have to be super careful of is like. There, you in order to get the cost share with a lot of programs, you have to be compliant to their specifications. And sometimes their specifications, depending on the state, don't make any sense for a regenerative grazer because it's going to hamstring you with certain. Or they make parameters. sense, but they're very like clunky. Clunky, like yeah. you're using multiple mm-hmm. wires and you really don't need to, and so then calves have problems getting from like at like under a wire and then not being able to come back through, and or they don't. You yeah. big enough tanks. You don't have big enough tanks or like this for, for the amount of herd you have, for the size herd you have, or you just have to make sure that, because usually once you get in, enrolled in these programs, you have to stick with them for like 10 years or before you can, pay it back. yeah, or else you can pay it back before you can like tear it up or alter it in some way. So just really make sure you understand fully what you're getting yourself into before you start going into those programs. But it's but definitely something to look into. For so, someone starting yeah. out, it's a good way to... Cause like that's the one of the biggest costs starting out is your infrastructure, is your water and your fence. Yep. So if you can get that under you and it's functional, yeah, yep. it's huge. And you can work within their parameters mm-hmm. to get it yep. how you want, or to where yep. you can take it out like after you're done and yep. it be exactly what you want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 just understanding the rule book, so to speak. Yeah. And and again, it's very. It's extremely variable from state to state. So some states, the they're they really on the ball and they like you know understand sort of the needs of, of a high intensity grazer in certain aspects, and so they're going to be really compliant with like certain parameters and specifications. And other states are really archaic in the way that they think about things, and so they're going to force you to do things that it's not even worth getting cost share for because it's going to be so it's going to hamstring your operation so much with the way you have to set the fence up or the way you have to set the water up or whatever so mm-hmm. just know what you're getting yourself into before you do it but it's definitely something to look into um yeah and you can look all that stuff up online and or call the local office or extension or whatever um so that's a good question good question we haven't talked about that at all um, that, was a, that was a first yeah. first time or yeah I think it's a good one it, yeah. was, it was back to the old days of just pure questions it was kind of nice just get on a trip yeah um, <laughs> on a journey a journey I don't even really remember what number of episode this is it's like 40 something um, but we'll still keep cranking them out when we can they're just not going to be as consistent usually hopefully we'll be able to get more consistent now as we're you sort of de-escalating some of the intensity, but maybe you just never know. You never know on any given Sunday. You know, just take it up with the cows. They're usually the problem if <laughs> you don't end up doing this on a Sunday night. But take it up with the cows. Yeah. So thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next time.